Ken Anderson, uh, Christy McPherson, Family Promise. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, tell us, Ken, what is Family Promise? Family Promise is a coalition of 65 interfaith congregations. We have Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Islamic, Unitarian, and over 1,500 volunteers. So basically what we do is we shelter, feed, and support homeless families with children. The way that works is they stay for one week at night at one congregation. So after a week, they move to the next congregation. The following week, they move to the next congregation. All volunteer run at night. And then during the day, we have a day center, and that's where families can have shower, they can have uh, access to refrigerators, kitchen facilities, laundry, case management, uh, basically their basic needs. These and are homeless people. These are homeless families with children. And basically we provide this 24-hour support, three meals a day, and 80% of our families move out of homelessness into housing, usually about three to four months. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, where do they move into the housing? What housing? Uh, different types. Some move into market rentals. Some move into uh, public housing. Some move into what's called transitional housing. Some move into back with family, reunified back with family. So about half recently has been moving into market rentals. Mm -hmm. And you place them. We advocate with landlords or we advocate with people or we try to help build up their skills to search for these homes. But it's not a group goes to uh, one place. It's they go hither and yon. After they're in our shelter program, we help get them into homes of their own, uh, apartments of their own. So are you the CEO, the manager? I'm the executive director, and Christy is our program manager. So Christy, what kind of training have you and Ken had to qualify you for this really special job? Not enough, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually have my master's in social work, so um, I've worked in different fields of social work um, in substance abuse, in uh, mental health, child and family. So I think all those experiences have really led me to where I am now, working with families who have a myriad of issues. And so we're able to sort of figure out with each individual family what their needs are and then help them to develop goals so that they can address those needs and get into housing mm -hmm. with their families. It's all about housing. Ken, what's your training? Uh, Diverse, worked a little bit with government, worked with um, corporation, large corporation, nonprofits, but basically managerial, managerial experience, basically mm -hmm. trying to help build organizations. Christy, I got to say that I, I, uh, I'm very partial to social workers. I believe that people who go into social work are, are inspired, you know, and they are committed mm -hmm. to do the right thing for, mm -hmm. for the right reason. So good for you. Thank and good you. for you, Ken. <laughs> that you should that you should work in this in this calling why are you doing this well uh, personally mm -hmm. the reason I do this is um, like I used to be in the Peace Corps and I was doing economic development for the Peace Corps and something I learned at a young age it's probably due to my upbringing is I really believe parents want to take care of their kids and that if we just try to provide some of the basic support for them families can do a pretty good job of taking care of each other and there's a lot of people out there who don't have that opportunity they don't have that stability so I like doing this because it's helping provide stability to families in need and ensuring that every child has the same opportunity that we had when we grew up. Christy what about you um, why, why are you doing it? I think I already know the answer to that. <laughs> well I'm being a mother myself I, I found myself um, drawn to this position when it was um, announced that they needed a social worker. I, I felt that um, I couldn't imagine myself being on the streets with my children. And that's when I said, you know what, I think I have a calling to do this. And I also work with a lot of single mothers and being one myself, I feel that um, they have a certain, there's a certain uh, strength that women have and I find that I really can connect to them with them and um, and serve you know and help them uh, to move forward and I think um, my passion about it really comes through in my work with them so yeah. there but for the grace of God go yes. we all. Yep, yeah exactly so what's the difference between a, a, a person who is a homeless person without a family and a homeless person with a family it strikes me as all kinds of different dynamics there, yeah? There is. Um, <clears throat> well, I think with 
Um, anyone who has children has, of course, a major added responsibility. And um, I find that a lot of our parents who have children, they have a lot more expenses and they have limited ability sometimes because their children are really young. We have a lot of families that have really young children and so they don't have the means to pay for babysitting or childcare. So they have to stay home with the child, which means they can't work and they can't therefore uh, get housing very easily because there's just one wage earner mm -hmm. and usually the wage is minimum wage. It's amazing they can find housing at all which is why we need to increase living wage. But anyway, um, that's another story, but that's really what I see. And then there are those singles that, there's some who choose to be on the streets because it's um, something they, I think some of them actually like it. Tell me the percentage. I'm gonna have to defer to our executive director on that how one. Many, yeah. How many out of 100 people who are homeless, how many, I think the public needs to know the answer, whatever it is, how many like it, want to be there? Well, from our experience and the experience of other homeless providers we've spoken to, if you really get to know people, just about none of them really, really want to be so there. So when they tell you There's that defense they like mechanisms. it, it's a defense. Most of the time. They're, they're, they're fooling themselves. Um, I think sometimes we all have coping mechanisms. We have ways to handle life experiences. And if sometimes there's people who they've built up walls, they have a tough time trusting people, a lot of times mm -hmm. based on past abuse. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of those folks who say they don't want any help, it's amazing once people have established relationships with them, they mm -hmm. found, well, you know, I'm willing to give this a shot. Mm -hmm. So it's not always what we see is always the sure. internal reality. Sure, sure. And, Thank you for that. And I also want to say that I didn't mean they want to be homeless. I think I, they'd rather be staying maybe sometimes at the beach rather than being in a shelter because shelters are very structured. And if you're one that like me, who doesn't really like structure very much. It is not, you know, it's not very conducive. So um, they can still get their needs met and they can still receive help um, as an, in an outreach setting rather than being in a shelter. So I want to take, you know, I don't want it to sound like they want to be homeless because I don't think anyone really wants to be homeless. I've never met a kid who says, I dream of being homeless someday. Yeah. I mean, that's just <laughs> not kids. They don't aspire to that. But things happen sometimes. Right. So uh, I want to explore the, you know, this thing that has always troubled me about family homeless, you know. If you go to the mainland, I sense that on the mainland, you don't have that much family homeless because there are social networks, uh, social, uh, uh, what do you call it, nets, safety nets that will save them better maybe than we have, I'm guessing. And that, and that mm -hmm. in, on the mainland, a family that's homeless is at such greater risk, is it not, to predators and, and people who engage in crime against them than here. People are kinder here, I think, and they don't go after them in the same way. Am I right? Tell me. Well, I'm not an expert on everything that goes on in the mainland, but there are some disturbing facts. Um, you mentioned how it's more prevalent here, potentially. Uh, I was disturbed when I found out one out of every 50 children in the United States experiences homelessness at one point of his or her life. 25% uh, of all homeless people are children, most of those under the age of six, and 40% of all homelessness is actually families with children. That's not just here in Hawaii, that's nationally. So the struggle is when we th traditionally think of homelessness, we think of substance abuse, we think of mental health, we think of war veteran status. Those were the big three. What's happened, they tend to be very visual right in front of us. What's happened over the last 20 years, I'd say, I don't around that frame, is we're starting to get more of what I tend to call economic-based homelessness. We're getting more and more families who are working and they're, many of them, working full-time, but the cost of living has gone up so high and the wages haven't risen with them adequately to where they're just not able to make ends meet. So um, one of the reasons why I think that we tend to see the other types of homelessness is oftentimes that's on the beach or that's at the park or that's on the bench. Families with children, 
they tend to try to stay out of the public eye and they try to tend to be like for example Waimanalo Beach Park there's a lot of singles on the beach the families are usually tucked away back in the trees because they're trying to keep their kids safe and secure so it's not right they don't want to be bothered so just because it's we don't see it as much doesn't mean it's not there <clears throat> what is the the track what is the scenario? I mean, give me a common scenario. I know they're all different in, in their own way, but mm -hmm. what is the scenario by which a family in Hawaii finds itself homeless? Well, a lot of times, um, you know, there is a lot of overcrowding. Um, and so a lot of times our families will live with relatives and there's too many. I mean, we've all heard the stories. There's too many people staying in one apartment, which we actually don't think there is a problem with that as long as they're taking care of their home and you know paying their bills um, but I know the law is different um, but I think some of our families find themselves where um, say they have a great you know home to live in and all of a sudden maybe they have a child a, a young child and they're a young couple maybe don't have they don't have as much parenting skills and so their family members start getting frustrated that there's all these people in the house and not enough um, you know not enough supervision for the kids or just something small like that and they tell them I can't have you staying here anymore you know so it's um that might be just one of the situations. I mean, there's such a myriad of had. No, people, give me another one. Um, illness. Like yeah, an illness um, where the, someone loses their job and they can't pay the rent anymore, so they get evicted. They end up at the beach and they sleep in their car, and um, the kids are sleeping in the back seats and they're in the front seat every night, night after night, taking showers at the parks and just buying 7-Eleven for dinner or something. I mean, it's just there are so many stories, personal stories that I could share. I mean, we've seen over a hundred families come through our program and they all have their own situations, their own histories. Um, there's really no set history. There's really no one kind of story. There all, there's so many. You say a hundred have come to you. How many are there out there? Um, each year in Hawaii, it's estimated that there's about 15,000 people who will experience homelessness. Of that, about 40% will be families with children. That's funny. I, I recall the city said it was 4,700. 4, well, they have something that's called a point-in-time count, which a lot of times is reported in the news, and that's saying on that day, this is the number of people who are homeless. But if you look at, it's transitional. Sometimes people are homeless for a day, sometimes for years. Um, if you go over a course of a year, a good estimate, especially when I've talked with the Hawaii Public Housing Authority, is right around 15,000 over the span of a year. Some sheltered, some unsheltered. When I say sheltered, I mean like in emergency shelters like us or IHS or Next Step or some of the other shelters. And how long do they, they stay homeless? Uh, you guys are probably not making all that much, sorry, of a difference against 15,000 people out there. So if you take care of a hundred or a hundred families. So how long do they stay homeless? What happens? It depends on different scenarios. Like for us, Family Promise, we work with working families. And we work with families who do not have current substance abuse and do not have untreated mental illness. So we, our goal is to help these working families learn better financial management and move back into housing as quickly as possible. So you're, you're dealing with the ones that are right on, the, right on the border there. Our goal is to get people back into housing as quickly as possible and help prevent them from getting into that downward spiral that can lead to some of the more deep-seated issues that ha happen sometimes. So in Family Promise, so far we've had 83 percent have moved into housing and the average stay has been about three to four months. So usually three to four months we can help transition them. There's other programs and other people who have more intensive needs that it's a longer term process. So you've made a policy choice here that you want to help the ones at the edge mm -hmm. because yes. they're mm -hmm. more helpable. We have two things. One, we need to make sure that since we're volunteer based, we're 24 hours a day, two locations, yet we only have three full time staff. That's because we have 1,500 volunteers. So one, we have to have families that volunteers are equipped to serve. And two, since we work with children, we need to make sure there's a safe environment for those kids. So those parameters limit 
who we should be working with because we don't want to be arrogant and start thinking that we can do everything. We're really meant for a certain niche. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's a niche that you can have more of an effect in. Mm -hmm. For us. For example, the ones, uh, you know, who are who are, um, have drug problems, uh, where that, that's more difficult, isn't it? Yeah, and one of the nice things is we help free up resources for those programs who have those specialists right. who can really do that. And, um, a lot of our families have actually had some of those issues in their past, mm -hmm. but let's, ours is a, um, how would I describe it? A, uh, it's very holistic. Um, I think we work with our families not only on housing, but teaching them life skills that they can take with them like budgeting and um, nutrition. I mean, things that can help to improve their quality of life. And so when they get into their housing, it's not just the housing, it's sustaining that um, higher quality of life that they never knew before. And um, it's amazing how many families actually just change so dramatically, even within three, and, three to four months, um, they just, they just learn so much. You know, there was a program yeah. on 60 Minutes last week, uh, it's actually a replay of a program that played earlier about the Seed School uh, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. where, where it's, a, it's, a, it's a boarding school for ghetto kids, and they put everything into these kids, mm -hmm. and, they, and they do well, really well. Right. And so, it, I mean, it's proof, as I think you are, that if you, if you use modern techniques and thoughtful arrangements, thoughtful planning, and good, clear communication, you can actually make a difference. You can actually provide them with a new life and what, save them what's as that? never before. Am mm -hmm. I right? I've seen it happen. I've seen it, not with everyone, but yeah. with, with some. I've definitely seen that. Well, what's amazing is if you provide a family with the love and support that they need, or an individual, so often many of them don't have anybody giving them that love and support and mm -hmm. if you give that to them and you help them reestablish that sense of self-worth and self-dignity people are smart people are capable they can succeed they just sometimes need a little bit of help along the way and a lot of the families we've served unfortunately when they were kids they their parents were the ones who were either physically or sexually abusing them they don't have that family to turn to a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So like the program you mentioned or our program, if you create that extended family, you can give that support to people when they're not getting it or mm -hmm. where they're not getting mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So uh, where do you find them? Where do you find your clientele? Um, we, get, we get families from everywhere. I mean, we get them from uh, pastors that will call and say, I've had someone come by my office and but it comes from religious organizations not yeah. only um oh. we actually we get most of our referrals from like AUW they have the 211 line and they'll give them our number and it goes from there or we get it from um you know I have a lot of friends out there in the social work field and so they'll call me and say I have a family that might be appropriate and they know what our um you know they know what our guidelines are for our program and they think this family can meet those guidelines and those um, criteria so they refer the family and um, we just get them from everywhere. I've even had personal friends say I have a family I know can you help them and I say put them on the referral list you know. Referral business is the best. Yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's lots of fun. <laughs> so what, what groups are they? I mean can you give me a handle on the demographic here? Are they, do they start out in lower income groups? Is that what happens? They don't, they don't come from rich families living in Kahala or anything. No, I don't think I've oh. ever heard that one before. <laughs> um, they are all definitely low income or low to middle income. Um, I've only had maybe two families out of a hundred that didn't meet the criteria to receive assistance with uh, rent you know, or something because they didn't meet the low income uh, criteria. So. Uh, they're all low income, yeah. So we get, we get federal money for, for the assistance with the rent? How we much we can... don't personally, but we work with organizations that assist our families with uh, rental deposits or first month's rent or help with utilities, um, those types of things. How much money can a, can a family get from these uh, uh, federal funds? 
Well, they can get their first month's rent, whatever that might be. So if it's a thousand five hundred, that's how much they get. So um, that's one and of the that's benefits. That's actually so. paid to the landlord, not to them. Right. So it's not like they pocket sure. that money, right. but right. it goes for housing. Now, right. what about the state? Is the state uh, is the state providing actual money on this? The state does. Yeah. I have to give the state a lot of credit. About the last two or three years, they've created a lot of new initiatives. Um, about three years ago, we actually, Family Promise, sat on a task force, but the state deserves credit. They created the uh, Next Step Shelter in Kakawako. And since that point, they have... That was in the steel factory. Yeah. They I did. remember that. We did a show on those steel guys, <laughs> the steel factory. It's amazing what you can do it with was, a building. <laughs> everything happened in like four to seven days. It was an amazing proce process, and it just showed that when there's the will to act, things can happen quickly, even with government. Um, after that, they've actually helped develop probably about a couple thousand emergency shelter beds, transitional housing, short-term housing, and long-term housing beds. And they also, the Hawaii Public Housing Authority, which is funded by the state, they actually provide funding to most of the homeless and affordable housing programs in Hawaii. So the state's helping, but by no means is it close to what the real need is. Yeah, I want to talk about that, but but one one question before, just to get a, a handle on how this works. You have risks, you know, you can get a client in the door, but then the client can spiral out of control and down that slippery slope. Yeah. So I asked you before about the scenario by which people, families found themselves homeless. Can you give me some scenarios about how the, the, the family homeless can lose it and, you know, spiral down? What happens? You mean spiral down before coming into our program? Or after? Or after. <laughs> well, we've had both. <laughs> um, rarely is it after, but a lot of times before. Um, you know, I've had a couple families I've worked with that um, actually were using heavy, heavy drugs. And, um, you know, they ended up where... This is they the just, parents. Yeah, the parents. It's always the parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we work so closely with the parents, because they're the ones who can change things for their whole family, of course. Um, and so one of the fathers, he just he was just using everywhere. I mean, just using ice everywhere he could get it. And, um, you know, they had a lot of children. Um, he ended up coming in our program. I ended up having to release him from the program and keeping the mother and her children in the program. And um, today he is doing excellent. He is, um, you know, sometimes giving them that extra, you know, <laughs> it's that it's just releasing them and saying, look, you need to go get your act together and come back. Um, and ever since he left, he's been doing better and better and better. And um, I've had a couple families like that. And to be honest, they are my success families <laughs> because they're the ones who really were at the lowest of their lives, the lowest of lows. I mean, jail, prison, you know, and then they come and rise out of that. And it's so amazing to see that transformation. So um, the range of people that you're talking about are what? From their late teens to... I mean, late the parents teens. now to what their late 30s um most of them are within the 20s and 30s range um there are a few that are in their 40s and there are some that are in their 50s but mostly they're in their younger years i find um which means that they haven't had as much life experience and so a lot of them are a little green you know and they and they need they have a lot of uh skills that are still being developed so you counsel with them they come to you from the streets. They're, yes. they're on the streets, yeah. they're on the beach, mm -hmm. and they come to you. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. You go to your office, and there's somebody <laughs> waiting to, to talk oh, to you. Oh, there's always someone waiting. <laughs> and, there's and always. So you actually render this love, advice, uh, you, your whatever services you perform mm -hmm. and connections you provide mm -hmm. for them. It's right there at your office. Yes, yeah? and it's all from here. <laughs> I do all yeah. my work from my mouth yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's really tough love all the way you, you know tell them, you tell them straight yeah and I tell them look I'm not asking you to do anything that I don't do myself yep. so I'm not speaking just as someone uh, looking in I'm speaking as someone who does it herself so I expect the same of you mm -hmm. and so they go oh okay <laughs> they can't really say anything so how many Christie's are there 
<laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> if it, if you're referring to the negative side, I'm just very few <laughs> negatives. Um, uh, we actually operate two programs, 24 hours a day, with just one Christy. And what we try to do is we've been partnering with UH and HPU and University of Phoenix to try to get practicum students. Part of our commitment is to really embrace the community and try to avoid just hiring person after person but really try to take a community-based approach and the universities are one of those members of the community so they've been very helpful so we can help more people who Christie can as much as possible replicate little Christie's throughout the <laughs> island basically who are a lot smarter than me <laughs> So, so uh, do you have people graduating from UH, from the social work school there, who, who are interested in doing the work that Christy does, uh, yeah. who are yes. available, and do mm -hmm. they come and volunteer, or do you have to pay them? What's the deal? Well, we actually have students that, um, that do their practicum at our site for a mm -hmm. whole year, mm -hmm. and so they learn all the skills that they need, and that's one thing I tell them is I want you to be ready so that when you go out into the field, you're ready. You can handle any job. You know, you have all the skills behind you. Um, and we've had, we haven't, of course, had anyone come to Family Promise to work because it's only me. Um, but if we had the opportunity, I could easily hand select three or four that have come in and out of our practicum experience, you know, at Family Promise and hire them on the spot because I know they can do the job. Um, and some have gone on to other agencies mm -hmm. and worked and continue to work with the homeless. So I'm really proud of them. What's How nice? old is Family Promise, Ken? Uh, nationally, we're actually affiliated with a national organization. So nationally, Family Promise started about 1988. We came to Hawaii in 2006. So grassroots, nobody came to plan it here. It was just people in the community said, hey, I did this elsewhere. It could work here. So our Windward Network started March 2006, and our Honolulu Network started July 2007. And we're actually looking to try to do a third network of congregations, so we're hoping if anybody wants to be part of the solution, that they'll give us a call, and they'll say, hey, we'd like to help, and we'd like to plug them in. Christy, do you recommend it as a career? Yes. Why? I do. It's one of the most challenging jobs you'll ever have, and it's also one of the most rewarding. And I say that because I've been in so many different jobs over the past, my long history, 15 <laughs> years. But I really, um, I really think that this is the job that I love the most. And that's because I get to see the results right away. You know, when you work with people who aren't quite ready to make that change and to really, it's like you have to kind of do baby steps. You don't see the results till years later. And I have seen that. And at the same time, I love it when I can actually see a family walk into their new apartment and say, mm -hmm. this is mine. And that's the most gratifying feeling for me. Family Promise has a number of uh, offices. Where are they? Uh, we have, we mentioned how at night they stay at the different congregations. But during the day, we have a day center in Kailua and a day center in Chinatown. And when you say stay with the congregation, they stay actually in a church of some kind? Um, for the Christian faith, yes, they stay in a church or Buddhist church. So at some, it's in the sanctuary. For some congregations, it's at classrooms. For some congregations, it's a social hall that they partition with like wires and sheets. Because we insist that every family has a visually private sleeping area. We don't believe in what we'll call warehousing of families. So each family has their enclosed sleeping area, even if it's just sheets. Mm -hmm. So it um, really helps keep the dignity of the family intact. Do, do people ever volunteer to have these people come in their homes? We actually don't permit that. Um, because? Well, there's a few reasons. One, we feel it would be unsafe and inappropriate for people to bring our guests into their personal home. I mean, we do have to be conscious about liability issues and stuff. However, at the congregational level, there's a community place where people can stay and they can feel safe. And even from the legal side, there's general liability insurance. And um, we're bringing in families, and we have a responsibility to protect our families, but also to make sure that our volunteers are in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that during the day, you give them tough love. 
<laughs> and at night you give them something else? Soft love. Soft I don't love. give them the soft love. No, I'm just kidding. What's the difference? Uh, well, during the day, Christy does a lot of the accountability. Uh, we work with the financial counseling. We work with the housing assistance, the employment assistance. And as she el so eloquently says, likes to give them a nice kick in the okole every <laughs> once in a while. But at night, we actually train our volunteers not to intervene in those issues. They're actually there to just provide love and support for the families. And that really makes a huge difference because none of us can just be getting beat up all the time. <laughs> we need a period of time. <laughs> I beat them up too, you know? <laughs> figuratively. But um, we all need a time to rest and to spend time with family. And I really think one of the greatest uh, reasons for our success is Every night our families are surrounded by volunteers who are there because they want to be there that mm -hmm. one night every three to six months. And they provide this loving environment and atmosphere that really creates that sense of place and that sense mm -hmm. of family. So you partner the accountability with the support and you're really providing what the family needs emotionally and mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, when, before we go to macro issues, I just want to ask you one other thing that's troubled me. I understood from somebody in the business that there are, there are uh, I don't think you'd call them a family, they're groups of kids, teenage kids and, and less, who, uh, especially in Chinatown, who, who run loose and who make their living, who get their food as they will. <clears throat> and uh, they, they can't rely very well on, on any of the soup kitchens because they're just kids. And the, the soup kitchens are obligated to call the police and Nobody wants to do that. So the result is we've got this Charles Dickens kind of phenomenon going on in, in uh, not far from uh, this studio. Um, and I wonder if you have any contact with that, if you know about it, or at least confirm to me that it, that it does happen. It happens. It, I'm sure it happens. Um, we don't really have, because we work with adults um, who have children, um, we don't work so much with teenagers that are you know, maybe runaways or, or they just don't want to be at home for some reason. Maybe they're abused or those are usually the ones running the streets. Um, uh, and so I'm familiar with it, but we don't have a whole lot of... Uh, a couple contact. of groups that do help mm -hmm. a lot. For example, Hale Kipa has a program called the YO program, the Youth Outreach Program, which mm -hmm. really focuses on that specific scenario that you were mentioning. And there's even, for example, the Hawaii Foster Youth Coalition, there's a connection a lot of times between foster youth and future homelessness who try to help provide support to those former foster youth who, um, who they can help. So there's some programs out there trying to help, but just like we are limited in resources, they have limited resources too to meet the full need. Okay, I want to get into macro issues. Okay. And you guys, you know, you're not statisticians. I, I, I suppose you he keep is. records. <laughs> Neither of us. Are. You keep records of the people you deal yes, with. If I asked right. you who your clientele are, you know, you could tell me. But what I would like to know is uh, sort of a gestalt sense: is this problem increasing, reducing, or staying the same? It's increasing. Um, even in the last episode, we talked about the point in time count compared to fifteen thousand people per year. Uh, I actually have a couple stats in front of me. So just from 2005 to 2009, um, the numbers increased from roughly 5,000 in that point in time count to roughly 10,000 in that 2009 point in time count. So that's a doubling just in four years of people who came through that report. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is as the economy has gone down, there has been real struggles with employment. And as families, like all of our families are working, but it's harder and harder to get full-time employment. So if you're only able to secure part-time work, those types of families and individuals are having real difficulties maintaining housing. Mm -hmm. And employers are having a tough time getting those wages and hours to them. Yeah. It's sad even hearing about it. It's um, a, it's a <clears throat> so it's all, it's all about not having enough, call it earnings from your job or jobs, mm -hmm. to pay for 
subsistence level housing? Well, if you look at every year, there's a report called the Out of Reach Report. It's done by the uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition. And they measure what the wages base is compared to what the cost of living, and they do it for each state. So in Hawaii, to a market rental, about two bedrooms, mm -hmm. the market rent today is about $1,500, $1,550. A um, minimum wage earner makes seven twenty-five. I forget the exact number, but... Per hour. Per hour. <laughs> so to sustain a family of four, two, a minimum wage worker needs to work, I think it's about 160 hours per week. So even if you have two people working full-time, two jobs, it's actually more than 160. They're not able to even make it sustainably. So um, that's that, 80 hours a week per spouse. Per spouse, and that spouse. still doesn't cut it if you factor in transportation, food, living expenses, everything then beyond the housing. Then you got to take care of your kids. you got to yeah. have time at home. If you factor all that yeah. in, it just isn't sustainable. The gap actually in Hawaii, so they have what they call a housing wage. The needing, needed housing wage for Hawaii, according to this report, is about $29.50 per hour. That's what you need to support a family of four. The average renter in Hawaii only earns $13 per hour. So you need twenty nine fifty, you're only making thirteen, and most of our families are making They're not making thirteen. Seven twenty five. Seven twenty five to ten. Mm -hmm. That gap is so large. That gap is larger in Hawaii than any other state in the country. There's not a state the closest state is California, but they're not even that close when it comes to that gap. So is this gap getting worse too? Yes. The gap is widening. At mm -hmm. least as of the last three or four years I didn't look before then, but it's been increasing each year the last three or four years. Kent, that's mm -hmm. horrendous. It is. Housing costs, mm -hmm. even though, for example, housing costs, people have seen they've slightly gone down. When I say housing, I'm talking about rentals. Rental costs have slightly gone down the last year, but wages went down more so, or employment was harder to find during that time. So, so it's a market thing. It's a market thing. Mm -hmm. So... It's a real struggle. It's not just about affordable housing. It's also about what we call sustainable wages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I guess it's, it's just putting some of the things you said uh, together. It's about um, these apartments uh, have gotten smaller. Yeah. Because of the cost of land is greater, so mm -hmm. the developers make them smaller. And what's frustrating is you have families who say, let's take care of each other. Yeah. Let's get nine, 10, 11 people in here. And we realize you need to be safe and you need to be um, hygienic. But it's really tough when you get to a point where the family says, okay, either everybody gets kicked out or we're gonna have to kick out a few of the people so that we don't lose our place. It's hard to find where's that magic mm -hmm. balance, but- um, Sophie's choice. Yeah, really. And it's a hard choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is an awful picture, and I I, uh, I guess I wanted to ask you, among other things, here in, in in our policy discussion, does the public know? I didn't know some of the stuff you're you're telling me now. I, does the public know what's going on? Uh, is there any way they could get to know? Is there anybody reporting out on this? Well, I mean, a lot of my friends are not in the housing field, so they, you know, I teach them as much as I can, um, educating anyone I can about what's going on. Um, some are interested, some are not as interested. Uh, but I think the majority of people can see with their own eyes what's going on, but they may not know the little, you know, the details of how people become homeless. They may not know the stories and, and know that they're not all on drugs and they're not all, you know, lazy. You know, a lot of them are working really, really hard and those are the families that we're trying to help. Um, I remember about 60 days ago there was a thing in the paper about um, a number of homeless people who were camped out behind Waipahu High School <clears throat> mm -hmm. and the police decided that this was not hygienic and mm -hmm. they raided the place and mm -hmm. scattered everybody to mm -hmm. the wind. I don't think they made arrangements for them, but they did scatter them. And uh, I thought to myself, uh, is that really, is that news? I mean, I suppose it is news in the sense we didn't know they were doing this. Maybe not now, in now that now location. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 the people uh, only, a lot of people only seem to get interested when 
it's right in front of their house. Yeah. One of the things I think is hard for people to understand, let's say you've lived here 30, 40 years, and let's say you bought a house 34 years ago. Well, you had your mortgage from 30, 40, 30, 40 years ago. One of the things I do in trainings is I ask people, I moved, personally, I moved here in 2002. I had a two bedroom, one bath townhouse under 800 square feet. It was renting for $800 in 2002. And I ask people, how much do you think it's renting for today? And most people think, oh, 1200, 1100. <laughs> It's renting for sixteen to eighteen hundred dollars. So it's unless you're in the rental market and you're paying those monthly rents, it's hard to even imagine just how expensive it's gotten to rent a home or rent an apartment. I mean, it's really hard to grasp. So with the, these homeless families that you place, uh, is there a recidivism? I mean, they go back into that man-eating market out there and how can they how can they deal in a market which which charges so much for a rental unit it's tough well we tell them pay your rent first yeah. I mean I think a lot of families when they come into family promise they're so used to giving money to their family members 200 here 300 there or maybe just going to Walmart and spending a hundred dollars without even thinking twice and then they're going oh I don't have enough money for my rent and it's amazing how when they start to change their thinking about how to use their money wisely and realize that oh if I give my family member four hundred dollars for their rent gee I don't have enough for my family <laughs> you know and those are simple yeah. things that may seem like common sense to us it's, it's kindness but in its to own them way, you know? yeah I mean they're being very uh, very altruistic and very generous but the problem is they're not taking care of their own yeah. so uh, we're trying to teach them regardless of what you have going on in your life you pay your rent first and yeah. everything else falls in place after that. Well, it sounds like the root of the problem, you know, expensive housing and low wages uh, is getting worse. Yes. And the gap is getting worse. And I, you know, in all, it's, it's, it's not like um, people know enough to, to, to step up and, and uh, you know, volunteer on their own motion to solve this problem. This is a problem where government needs to step in. Yes. There's nobody else but government that's really positioned to do anything about this. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, um, what is government doing about it? I mean, you don't have to raise your voice about this. Just tell me, <laughs> flat effect, what is government doing about it? Not enough. And if you ask the government, I think they would acknowledge they're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. um, they have, the last few years, started to help try to do some more shelters. They've tried to develop some transitional housing, temporary housing, some permanent housing. But the reality is each year we're having more new households than we're having new units. So we're still falling mostly further behind. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of discussion about government helping to facilitate more affordable housing. We just need to get to the point where that discussion translates into more action and that buildings start going up mm -hmm. basically and attracting if you want to talk about sustainable wages make sure that you set an environment where businesses that pay higher wages are here and that there's also the training so that people who were born and raised here can really plug into those jobs and have more um, sustainable livelihoods mm -hmm. well let me go into some of those points um, first of all building a sprung structure which is almost by definition a temporary structure like the ones out in Waianae, <clears throat> I don't think it's a solution because it's temporary yeah, and right. because we're, we're talking, talking about, about mm -hmm. separating the family so they have some modicum of privacy. It's very hard to do that in a, one of those big sprung structures. Mm -hmm. So that's not a solution. What, what is a solution in terms of government building houses? Is it like the Chicago low-income projects? No. Uh, what is it like? Um, from what we see, we need more affordable housing. We need more, even what we call workforce housing. Because one of the things that's happening is, like where I live and where Christy lives, mm -hmm. we're actually living in units that probably should go to people who earn less than us. However, it's all we can afford. So we're competing 
with the same people we're trying to help a lot of times. So if we even, I think we need more low income housing for those people who are making very little money minimum wage. Mm -hmm. But we also need a lot more what's often called workforce housing so that the teachers, the firemen, the policemen, the uh, social workers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that we have a place, and as we have these places, that also frees up a lot of these other units that were really originally designed for lower income families, as well as adding more low income so housing. The middle well. class people are occupying what was designed for. Lower class families. A lot of times. A lot yeah. of times, yeah. I think especially now. And that means what that means is there's a dynamic and it's going the wrong direction. Yeah. Yes. They're not stepping up, they're stepping down. <laughs> you know? Well yeah, I mean what was considered middle class in the seventies is no longer middle class now. Yeah. It's it's amazing the difference. So what, what happens uh, if you just continue this continuum of <clears throat> not enough decent paying jobs? of an economy that just doesn't generate that much income mm -hmm. for the guy at the bottom, you know, without mm -hmm. the degrees and all mm -hmm. that. Um, at the same time, where housing is simply more expensive than they can ever afford. What is, if we do nothing, I told you I was going to ask you this question. <laughs> <laughs> if we do nothing, what is going to happen on a society level? And social workers are supposed to know the answer to this, right, Oh, Christine? I can only imagine what's going to happen. <laughs> it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. What does that mean? Does that mean pitchforks in the streets? What does it mean? Well, if you look at history, well, when you get to a point where you have mm -hmm. the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. you do start to get civil discontent. Mm -hmm. And some people would argue that the higher crime rates on the Waianae Coast is a precursor to some potential issues because... I have friends on the Waianae Coast and there is a bit more anger on that side mm -hmm. than there is on some of the other places and it's this perception is why aren't we having the same opportunity and mm -hmm. it, it's a tough road to go down and you really, a healthy society, if we're going to talk philosophically, is really on, based on a large middle class and if you start getting a deeper and deeper split mm -hmm. between the two, people are not happy and when people are not happy or they become desperate, desperate people start to make desperate decisions sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be the doom and gloomer, but the reality is we, people will be housed and sheltered. Mm -hmm. It just matter. it's only going to be, are we going to house them in a healthy way, or is it going to be housed through increased hospitalization, increased crime, and increased other issues, basically. Yeah. The people are here, they're not going away. Now, now, you guys said one of your offices is in Chinatown. I remember that uh, the city administration uh, started an initiative in Chinatown to build some affordable housing. And I wonder if you could comment on whether that was a good plan to start with, and whether it was properly executed, and whether the, the NIMBY people who stopped it uh, you know, are, are in the right place or in the wrong place, uh, philosophically. Near you. Um, well, <laughs> I can say that the project was, to, in my eyes, it was a good idea. Yes. I will say that. Um, I think the way they were going to go about it, the kind of program they were going to initiate in there under the Housing First model would have been very successful. Mm -hmm. I'm quite disappointed it didn't go through, to be honest, and this is just speaking for myself. Um, I know people had issues with the way the development was going to you know the the process i think people were concerned with the process as much as they were with the nimby issue you know not in my backyard but the the issue i have is would you rather see people sleeping in your the in the little area in fronting your restaurant at night or would you rather see them in a building where they're actually learning independent living skills and having a case manager to help them um I kind of don't see the reasoning there, but that's just me. <laughs> it was frustrating because... I'm with you, Christian. We <laughs> actually you. attended Thank a lot you. of these meetings oh, and spoke in support for the program. One of the biggest frustrations was so much of the resistance was based on fear that wasn't actually based in reality. Because mm -hmm. they've done these Housing First projects in other locations, and what it's shown is when you build these projects, Housing First projects, it does not attract new people to that community. 
It actually serves those in need mm -hmm. in that community, and it actually helps create a safer, healthier neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there is so much fear and discussion about how, oh, it's going to be this magnet for all these new problems. Yet when you look at how it's worked in Philadelphia and Chicago and New York, and I know Hawaii is different, but mm -hmm. the reality is it's shown consistently an ability to serve the people in that neighborhood and create healthier neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that the biggest resistance was from people who said it was going to create a less healthy neighborhood. And it was, mm -hmm. from our perspective, not based on fact. Well, why did it fail? I mean, you, you, as I said before, you have to look to government for leadership on this. Um, and we know government can be very forceful sometimes, at least in the city here <laughs> in Honolulu. It can be very forceful about getting its uh, initiatives through. Uh, was the city forceful enough? Uh, could the city have made this happen? Um, certainly a, a NIMBY protest is not the be-all and end-all of a project that's critical for our society. What happened? Well, let me get this. Here's what we know. <laughs> We know that there is a specific plot of land. We also know that there was funding to build it. And we know that there were sufficient resources. Yet in spite of that, the decision was made not to move forward. Um, the city made that decision. Ultimately, mm -hmm. that would have come yeah. through those channels. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, there is the land. There is the money, there is the resources. There still was work that needed to get done. And to my understanding, that funding still could be released at some point in time. So hopefully there's still future opportunity that even though it's on life support that this project or something similar isn't completely dead yet. Well, I hope the, uh, the city's listening. I hope the next mayor is listening. I hope the previous mayor could have had the benefit of your advice. I think well, I won't say anything. <laughs> okay, don't say anything. Don't say a word. I won't say a word. <laughs> okay, now my next, my last question here today is: uh, What do you you know if you were if you were king or governor <laughs> or mayor, <laughs> what what would you do to ameliorate what is what is turning out to be a very difficult and actually a threatening um, problem? And I say threatening not in the physical security sense but a, a threat to our society, to our way of life, to, you know, all the good things about Hawaii. This, this threatens those mm -hmm. things. What would you do to fix it? I give you all the power, all the money you want. <laughs> what do you do? All right. The first thing I would do is remind everybody that every human being has the fundamental right to housing and to opportunity. And every child has the right to basic housing, basic food and nutrition, and basic support. So if we, as a community, can say everybody deserves a basic standard of living, they need to do their part. We're not saying they don't need to do their part, but we understand that all of us have worth and value. Then I would make sure that my priorities, because that's really all government is. It's a group that tries to set priorities and figure out where to put its resources. We would start shifting some of our resources to make sure that people's basic needs are taken care of. You mean community resources? Uh, tax base, community resources, federal resources. We would yes. make sure that one of our priorities would be that there is adequate housing that can be accessed by, especially. It's just, in my opinion, morally wrong that somebody can work full time and still not be able to afford a place to mm -hmm. live and support their family. Well, I think you want to say, which is the thought I've had, is that every time there's a sad situation on the street, like you guys see every day, that's a shame to all of us. Yeah. It's it an is. embarrassment, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's a, it's a, it eats away at our own moral fiber mm -hmm. for, for permitting it mm -hmm. every time. And that's what Ohana mm -hmm. is. Ohana yeah. is talking about a family that takes care of each other. Let's not let anyone fall behind. Let's not mm -hmm. have anyone fall through the cracks. Let's come together as one Ohana and make sure that we take care of each other, mm -hmm. even when it's not comfortable. Because there's times when it can get darn uncomfortable. From your lips mm -hmm. to God's ears, but in a modern nuclear society, it's very hard to do that. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's people shouting 
a million causes out there every day, walking the halls of the legislature six months a year, mm -hmm. asking them to come together on this or that or the other thing. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's a question of priorities. It, ultimately, it's about funding. Ultimately, I, it's about the, the, mm -hmm. the, the quality of our lives together mm -hmm. in society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, it is. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of for Hawaii itself, I, I feel very passionately about this, is that um, we need to get more federal funding to help to fund Hawaii for taking on some of the mm -hmm. uh, some of the issues. You know, we have a lot of immigrants coming here, Kofa, Kofa um, immigrants, and we also we do have a lot of people on the streets that come from Micronesia or places like that, and we need more funding. We need more housing. You know, it's like when they go to New York or any other state, when you have a large population coming in, you have to have the funding to be able to prepare, to provide for them. And um, I just think we've been ignored. I think Hawaii's been ignored personally um, by the federal government. And I think if we had someone that could really try and garnish those, uh, that funding, um, I think it would make a huge difference here. I give you $10 billion. That, that just happens to be what I estimate rail will cost. I give wow. you $10 billion. <laughs> $10 billion. Wow. They say six, but we know better. <laughs> I, can, I can't count beyond f you know, 5000 <laughs> You can't count beyond your daily, your weekly yeah, paycheck. My weekly you paycheck, <laughs> you know, $1 million. It's what hard. Do you do with them? What do you do with your $10 billion to fix? Can you fix it for $10 billion? How do you fix it? Or how do you try? I think you could. I think you could do wonders with $10 billion. I think, one, you put money into building affordable housing. You need that affordable housing to provide the infrastructure. Two, we try to make sure that every child, especially those who are the victims of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, that they are getting the support that they need, which will try to help make sure that they don't fall into some damaging adult life choices. Three, we make sure that those students who aren't getting the resources they need have the same option, get that extra work, that extra attention to make sure that they raise their um, performance because the reality is we need more of our kids going to college. And basically if you can get the affordable housing and you can create a better cared for and a better educated group of children coming forward, it's going to attract those businesses anyway. Um, and you've now are starting to create a sustainable economy with real housing options. And um, you've got a whole new generation of families who have a better standard of living than their parents did, which is the Hawaiian dream, the American dream. And then we can start moving back in the getting healthier direction, not regressing the way we are right now. Thank you, Ken Anderson. Thank you, Christy McPherson. Thank you. Thank you, Family Promise. You guys are wonderful, and it's, it's, a, it's a treat to be able to talk with you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.